Today I'm going to share on the new wineskin. But I hope you and your family had an absolutely wonderful Christmas. And I, I hope you have great plans for the new year because we have a great time coming up. 2016 is going to be an absolutely awesome year in the midst of everything, in the midst of the shaking and the problems, the circumstances, the trials, the tribulations that are going on in the world around us. The hand of God's favor is upon his children. On New Year's Eve, we have one of our uh, well, most well-attended and uh, wonderful prophetic moments and services of the entire year. We do a watch night service every year on New Year's Eve. We're going to be at the Gathering Place in Aurora at 210 Edward Street in Aurora. We'll be putting information up on the screen of how you can do that, how you can get there, or if you can't get there, maybe you can see it as we live stream it to you uh, right there from the gathering place in Aurora with Pastor John and Victoria Irving hosting us there in Aurora as they did last year. It's a wonderful gathering place and an apostolic resource center uh, that's in the uh, Aurora, the greater Toronto region, and uh, just a wonderful, wonderful place. Come on up and be with us. By the way, there's still a little bit more time for you to reach out to friends and family and to make the love of Jesus Christ real to them during this Christmas holiday season. Hi, I'm Russ Moore, the president of Eagle Worldwide Ministries and your host on Living on the Edge. What a wonderful time and a wonderful season that we live in. One of the greatest moments in all of history. This is the time that every prophet prophesied about. We're in the midst right now, just about every believer that I know is in the midst of change, transition, and transformation. The prophetic season we're in is that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And the world around us is being shaken dramatically. Governmental systems, the education systems, the business and finance, uh, the media is changing and transitioning as well. Just about every facet of life and society around us and just about every nation of the world is being put into a season of change, transition, and transformation. The church, which is the body of believers, not the building that we go to, but the, the church is actually the body of believers. Those to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Those to believe that God raised Christ from the dead. Those that are washed in the blood of the Lamb. We make up the body of believers. And we're the bride that he's coming back for, without spot or without wrinkle. This is the church. And you know, the church is in the midst of the greatest change and the greatest transition in its entire history. We have never gone through this. The body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, has never gone through a time and a season of change like this in all of its history. Maybe uh, in the Reformation in the 1500s with Martin Luther was, uh, was certainly a great changing time and season, and there's been lots of different waves of change. But church is being changed right now in the 21st century. I believe that this, we're on the threshold of the greatest move of the Spirit in the history of the church. I believe that we're on the threshold of the greatest battle. I believe this is the threshold. This is the beginning of the end times. This is a, a change like never before in history. And the church has to change. And the church is right in the midst of change. And the church is being shaken at its root and at its foundation. Many of us who comprise the church are now coming out of mainline denominational circumstances and situations, gathering places and fellowships. And we're, we, we've come out and sometimes we've changed buildings. You know, maybe we came out of Catholicism or Protestant or Evangelical, Pentecostal roots, but we've come out into some different and some new place. And maybe we change buildings and sometimes we've even changed doctrine and other times we've changed the style of worship. But many times we haven't yet changed our mindset. 
We maybe changed our clothes, but we're still thinking the same old way, the same way as the 20th century church. When God is trying to birth now the 21st century church, the end time church, I hear some prophetic voices say, and, and very convincingly, say that God wants the first century church. Well, you know what? God had the first century church, and he's seen it evolve. I believe he wants the 21st century church with the New Testament first century model. I believe he wants us to touch our roots so that we can reach our destiny. We have to know not only where we were, but where we're at and where we're gone. It's time for us to begin to get a legitimate understanding of what this 21st century church is supposed to be like. I believe it's meant to be a spirit contemporary church. A church that is relevant in our generation, in our time, in our season, relevant in every sense of the word, without being spiritually irrelevant. We can't lose our salt and light, nor the firmness in the foundation of a rock-solid foundation on the Word of God. So we need to change certain aspects of what we do. We didn't know where we were, where we're at, and where we're gone. But we can't lose the salt and the light just to please the people in our generation. I don't believe it's the intent of God that the church be seeker-friendly. He wants us to be spirit-friendly. All of creation, it says in Romans chapter 8, is awaiting the manifestation of the sons of God. And who are these sons of God, sons and daughters of God? Who are they? But those that are led by the Spirit of God. We need to be spirit-led, spirit-driven, spirit-contemporary. We certainly need to be relevant to this generation to be able to reach them with present-day technology and understanding and certain with, certainly to penetrate their cultures and traditions of this generation, uh, even using uh, music and entertainment and every form uh, of influence that can reach them where they're at. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is relevant from generation to generation, from tradition to tradition, and culture to culture. It's from faith to faith and glory to glory. We don't have to worry about the relevancy of the gospel. What we need to concern ourselves is how we deliver it. It's about delivery, about presentation. It's about the root and the foundation. It's about laying again and relaying that foundation of the first century church, of the New Testament model church, the church that was birthed and born on the day of Pentecost. That church came out in power came out in the power and the presence of God. That church within a generation touched the entire known world. In one, one and a half generations, touched the entire world. It started with just 120 people in the upper room. Just 120 people. And these people were not the great and sophisticated religious minds of their season, the Pharisees or the Sadducees. No, these were everyday people just like you and I. These were fishermen and, and businessmen and, and tax collectors. People from every walk in, of life in that time, in that season. But they had spent time with Jesus and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered to do the work that they were called to do. They had the love of Jesus Christ and they had the power of the gospel message. They had the good news and the good news that they had was with the life-changing experience they had with the living God, that Christ was not dead but he was alive and that his spirit was within each one of us, and that by the power of the Holy Spirit, they could reach out. These that just a month and a half or two months before were, were in a, a place of fear and uncertainty and, and were hiding from the authorities, but under the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the upper room and the day the church was birthed, a holy boldness came upon them, and they came out of the four walls of the building. And they came out in power and they came out in authority. And even on that first day, thousands were saved. 
thousands were added to the number of believers in Jesus Christ. This new church, this end time church, needs to be a church of relationship rather than a church of religion. Certainly we have to have sound doctrine and it's important that we have sound doctrine. And we talk about it, many of us have heard the prophetic voices that say that uh, that we need a a new wineskin and and God is going to pour out his new wine into the new wineskin. We know about that analogy and we know about that allegory and uh, and that that he used. But what does this new wineskin look like? What does this new church look like that he's going to pour into, that he's going to pour out a fresh move of his spirit into? What have we come out of? You know, we're, we're, we're somewhere in between right now. We're no longer where we were, but we're not yet where we're going to be. What we need to do is to have that first century model in a spirit contemporary look in this hour that's going to be relevant to this generation. We need to go back to that foundation to that blueprint that he laid out in the New Testament. See, God's a God of order and a God of discipline. He has a blueprint for everything. When he spoke to Moses, I'm sorry, when he spoke to Noah, he talked to Noah and he said to Noah, I I, I want you to build this ark. He didn't just say build a big boat. He told them how big, how wide, how tall, windows and everything else. You know, when he talked to them about the tabernacle in the wilderness and and, and, he, and they, they, they go to build the tabernacle in the wilderness, he told them the dimensions of it in the outer court, the inner court, the holy of holies, the, uh, what type of material to use to build it. It's important that we know that God is a God of order. As he's rebuilding his church, as he's rebuilding the dwelling place for him, this holy tabernacle on earth, which he calls his church, the body of believers, the place where he's going to dwell in in, in the habitation uh, of the praises of his people. He tells us how to build it. He gives us that New Testament model that, that he used for the power of the Spirit. He used Paul to explain many of those things to us. Sometimes we need to take a look at what it was, what it's about. We need to even revisit why do we go to church. We go to church to fellowship, to hear sound doctrine, for corporate prayer, for warrior intercession, for corporate radical tabernacle worship that he talks about in the book of Acts that he's going to restore in the last days. He's going to restore the tabernacle of David. Importation is one of the reasons why we go to be launched, to make disciples, to mentor leaders, to advance and extend the kingdom of God, to receive the healing that we need to get well, to get equipped to be ministers, not just to receive ministry. What's he trying to do in our time and in our season? He's trying to mobilize the church to get us outside the four walls of a building, to penetrate society. He wants us to be the head and not the tail. You know, in, in, the, in the early church, there was no such thing as, as the leaders and the people, as the clergy and the laity. Hey, we're the people. We are the people. We are all the people. The leaders in the church, just like Paul, were working at our salvation with fear and trembling like every other believer. We're the body of believers. Each one of us brings something special and something wonderful to the table. According to the exhortation of Peter, he said that we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. In other words, that we're a nation of priests. That's once we come to the knowledge of Christ, we are priests and we are ministries. In that very moment, seeds of excellence were put in our spirit and a ministry was birthed. You are a minister or you're not saved. To minister means to serve. Every one of us, from the moment we were touched, we were touched more and for more than just salvation. There's a lot of people that have a revelation of the gospel of salvation. And they are saved, I believe. But they have not yet walked in kingdom glory. 
They're not walking in successful Christian living. They're not walking in the kingdom of God. And when Christ came, he didn't come preaching church. Christ came preaching kingdom. John the Baptist said, repent ye, means turn, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus came bringing in the kingdom, and we're called to extend and advance the kingdom. With the same power and same authority that Christ has, he gave to us. The same mandate that he had in Isaiah 61 is the mandate that he gave to the disciples in Matthew and Mark 9. The same one that he has given us in Mark 16, 15 through 20. The mandate of the believers, the ministry of the believers. That's the season and that's the time we're in. This is the day of the saints, the day of body ministry, the day that we're all one. That first century church was a church that was radical and on fire. That church was full of the power of God and the presence of God. That church was led by the Spirit of God. He established a leadership, according to Paul, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, of apostles and prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors. They're the leadership in the church. But all are ministers and all are priests and kings under God according to Revelation 1.5 and Revelation 5.10, through Christ Jesus, every one of us are called to minister. Every one of us are called to serve. Every one of us are called with a gift and a calling and talent and ability. We're all the same. We all bring a little something different to the table. And the same with the fivefold ministry. And the fivefold ministry of leaders, that clergy and laity mindset has to change more than anything else and turn in to the priesthood of the believer so that we begin to know and to recognize the gift of God and the call of God on each believer's life and how they fit into the body of Christ. How each of us working together and walking together, serving together, make up the body of Christ in the army of God. That's going to take back what was stolen. That's going to advance and extend the kingdom of God. It's not going to happen with just a few leaders. See, that 20th century model that that was actually started, that clergy and laity wasn't actually started for more than 500 years. When Constantine, a Roman emperor, came in to the, come into the knowledge of faith, for the first 500 years, the church was established without any understanding of church, clergy and laity. It was all about the people, and they were all ministers. They didn't need to highlight evangelists. Everybody was evangelists. In fact, when Paul commissioned Timothy, his, his disciple, his spiritual son, he said to him, do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of your ministry. We're all supposed to do the work of an evangelist. We're all supposed to share our testimony. We're all supposed to speak of the living Christ and the change that he brought in our own lives. He touched every one of us in one way or another, and it's time that those of us who have been touched know how we fit and know how we belong and know what this new church is supposed to look like. Unfortunately, when Constantine was uh, came to faith, he also wanted to force everyone else to be a Christian. And that's not the way God intended for us to be Christians, but rather by our own free will, not forcing our will on someone else. But he wants us by choice to serve him. The same way that Jesus said, not my will be done, but thy will be done. When we turn our lives over to him and let him live our lives, his life through us, when we decide to live the life of a disciple, a follower of Christ, it's a, a, it's a decision that we need to make based on a heart condition spoken to us by the Spirit of God, not forced on us by another man. But he tried to force it on his whole empire. And worse than that, he brought in a lot of his pagan customs, including a pagan way of worship. And before you know it, people 
uh, people who were ordinary believers uh, were, were were all of a sudden made some special force and wore hats and robes and things that try to make them look more holy and and it began to elevate this leadership that he called clergy and really it was supposed to be all the believers in the early church all the believers moved in the gifts of the spirit all of the believers evangelized all of the believers did miracles all the believers extended advanced the kingdom of god it was man to man heart to heart one by one they penetrated the entire known world in a generation or a generation and a half. That was without Facebook, uh, without Twitter, without all these newfangled ways of communication. There was no 24-hour CNN and Fox News around the world on the scene. These people penetrated the world. They changed the world. They turned the world upside down. These 120 ordinary people with nothing fancy, no fancy building and, and stained glass windows and fancy statues. and They had nothing. But they had the Holy Spirit in their heart and Christ in their lives. And they shared the love of God with the entire world one by one, heart to heart, spirit to spirit. They turned the world upside down. In fact, that's what it said in the book of Acts. He said, these that have turned the world upside down are now over James's house. They are now in our city. Are you turning the world upside down in your city? Are you turning your city upside down? Are you making change? Is the body of believers in your city in a place of unity and harmony filled with the spirit, the power of God outside the, the four walls of a church actually penetrating and changing our society the way that they did? We're change agents. We're revolutionaries. In fact, we follow the greatest revolutionary in the history of the world. So if I'm following him and emulating him, I'm going to be a revolutionary. I'm going to bring forth change. I'm going to be a change agent. You and I are meant and called to be world changers and history makers. We're meant to be the head and not the tail. We're meant to lead. And I, uh, it, it's important that we understand who we are. He gave us all power and all authority so that we could have dominion. We're supposed to have dominion over all things. In other words, we're supposed to rule and reign. Well, we need to be trained to reign. We need to change this system of, of, of modern day church and bring it into a spirit contemporary model, touching our roots and reaching our destiny. You know, there's going to be all different styles of this new, this end time church. Some just like in those days, like it was in Paul's days in Acts 20, 20. He said he held nothing back from them. But everything that was good for them, he shared with them, both publicly and from house to house. There's going to be house churches and a house church movement that's going to be birthed around the world. There's going to be small and large churches alike. God's not going to get rid of the mega churches. He's trying to transform them and change them. He's not just going to toss the, the, the uh, traditional church overboard. He wants them to change. He wants them to evolve into the 21st century end time church. He wants them to go back to the original model for leadership and the foundation for the church as it was in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 18 through 20 on the foundation of apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. He wants us to use the uh, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, model for leadership, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors, each one doing their role, each one bringing something different to the plate, each one bringing something different to the table, each one bringing their anointing and gifting and bringing change and building the church up to a place of its maturity, if you look at Ephesians chapter 4. He wants us to get out of the rituals and, and the religious mindset and move us 
into the present day relational mindset of a, a Christ who lives, a Christ alive. Christ is not dead, he's alive, the tomb is empty. He's in the hearts of his people. He wants us to have a living faith. Church is not a place that you go to, it's not a destination. He spoke of the church many times in the New Testament. He wasn't speaking about a destination or a place of worship. He was speaking about a people, a body of believers. Let's begin to change our mindset. You can still be the old wineskin, dressed in your jeans and contemporary garb with holes in it or whatever you want. You can be in a uh, you, you can be in a storefront building, but if you still have that same mindset of religion, you're still stuck in that old model. It's time to change our minds, change our hearts. It's time to look at what that what that model really looked like what the body of believers are supposed to be, how we're supposed to function and operate. He didn't only have uh, home churches, but he also had gathering places and fellowships. And that early church had synagogues and home churches. And then at church, uh, then Paul, as he began to go out, he began to to birth new churches. And those churches turned many of them into apostolic resource centers. There were lots of churches that were birthed in different cities and different towns and fellowships that were birthed and that were started. But then some of them turned into apostolic resource equipping and empowering centers. There were many of them right from the beginning birthing of the church. The first apostolic resource center was in Jerusalem. And he's trying now to reestablish apostolic resource centers around the world. That's one of the things that God is doing in our generation. Places where faithful ministers can gather together. Places where churches can come together. uh, Places where we can reach out and be who we're called to be. That first apostolic center was actually birthed uh, in Jerusalem. And there was a council in Jerusalem, and they all met in Jerusalem. But in the midst and after persecution, they were uh, uh, set apart and broken apart. And they gathered again in a place called Antioch, where they were first called believers. And that was the place where one new man was first established. Not black, white, red, or yellow, not young or old, not male or female. But they were all gathered together. And there were apostles and prophets and teachers that were in Antioch. And it was a launching center for Paul and Barnabas. It was a place where the Holy Spirit was moving. And not only in Antioch, but in Ephesus and Corinth, ultimately in Rome. But the whole purpose of the church was considerably different. I'm going to talk to you again some more about these apostolic resource centers, what they looked like, what was the role that they played in their region. They were regional by by impact, they, they they each one of them had, even though they all had the same mission, each one had a slightly different vision for their region and a mandate for their region. And I'm going to talk to you more about them as we proceed and go further along. Is talk about the the church of the 21st century. But he's raising up apostolic resource centers now. He's trying to change our mind. He's called us to be history makers, to be world changers, to be change agents in our generation. And the first thing that has to change is my mind and my heart. My mind and my heart have to change. I have to be willing to change if I'm going to be an agent of change and bring change to others. This church that ushers in the second coming of Christ, this end time church, has to be different than the, than the first century church. But we need to have the same foundation, the same understanding the same biblical New Testament model structure. I hope today we took a little walk together and saw some things. I'm going to talk to you more about this 21st century church in the days ahead. Enjoy. Have a wonderful time and a wonderful season. And and, and be willing to change. I don't know about you, but I want more. In 2016, I'm looking for more. In order for me to have more, I have to be willing to change and to transform and to let him transform me into what he wants in this present day church. Thank you for joining me today on Living on the Edge. You have a wonderful day. God bless you.